Hi there, it's Alexandra from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and it's a January garden tour. It's been a pretty mild winter so far here in South East England in Kent. Probably temperatures around 10, 11 Celsius during the day, maybe 14, 15 and really not much lower than 5 or 6 at night. Just the occasional frost but it has been really, really wet and this is unusual for this part of the world. Eastern England is the driest part of the UK and we often have hosepipe bands in the summer and it is usually wetter in the winter but at the moment it's so wet that every time it rains the ground just can't really absorb any more water. As far as the garden's concerned the leaves are off the trees and it's as if everything's just waiting for spring. The bird song is fabulous and there are a few really welcome signs of spring such as the snowdrops. I plant snowdrops in the garden. I try to choose types that naturalise because I don't want to replant every year. And I think snowdrops really do appreciate being somewhere where they're not going to get much disturbance. So in the parts of the bed where I tend to sort of dig things up and add things and change things year by year, snowdrops don't really do very well there. But whenever they're somewhere like around a tree where they're really not going to be disturbed, they do naturalise and they're so welcome at this time of year. Generally, the cyclamen is just spreading itself around the garden. It's got a really pretty leaf. And even when it's not in flower, it's just a real acid. It's great ground cover at this time of year. And then in the summer, it just disappears underground. So it's sort of really not taking up any space that you'd want to use for anything else. So I think cyclamen is a wonderful plant for this time of year. It's also time to be able to see what's wrong in the garden. And one of the first things I noticed was this around my Catinus cagaria tree. The Catinus, or commonly known as a smoke bush, is one of the most spectacular plants in the garden. In the summer, its leaves are a sort of bright purply red, and it has these puffs, smoky little puffs of flowers. And everybody remarks on it when they come into the garden. And the thought of having the garden without it is absolutely impossible. But it has had something called verticillium wilt. Every now and then a great chunk of it dies. This year we cut it down quite hard to give the new shoots a chance to re-establish. But I have just spotted this fungus on the side of it. So I went on to Twitter, which is a great resource if you're a gardener, because quite often you can put a picture on and people are so generous with coming in and saying, oh, well, I think that's that or that's this. And I put this on and four or five people said exactly the same thing, which is that it would be a bracket fungus or a Ganoderma. And that is something that attaches itself to vulnerable trees when they're in their dying phase. And the journalist Jean Vernon explained to me that trees have three phases. You've got the growing phase when they're young, and then you've got the mature phase, and then you've got the dying phase. But the dying phase can be quite long. And indeed, quite a few other people came along and said exactly the same thing, that if you've got a fungus on a tree like this, it may still last quite a long time. But of course, the important thing is to make sure that it, as it gets weaker, that it can't fall or topple or cause any damage to either people or buildings. Now this tree is right in the middle of a border and we brought it down quite a lot in height. So I think it's completely safe as far as that's concerned. But who knows how much longer it's going to be in this garden. Lots of you have commented on our dog Lottie and so I thought this would be a good opportunity to tell you a bit more about her. Lottie is a Saluki cross and she's a rescue dog and she's our second Saluki. Our previous dog was also a rescue dog and he was a pure Saluki. And Salukis were the first dogs that ever hunted with man. They were bred from the Arabian wolf, some people think about 7,000 years ago. And they are one of the oldest, if not the oldest, breed of dog. And this makes them quite kind of old fashioned in their approach to life. And I often get the feeling that anything that existed 7,000 years ago, they understand perfectly. But anything that's more of a new invention, like cars and roads, they are totally confused by and they actually don't see any point in even thinking about. So a Saluki, like greyhounds, have to be kept on the lead everywhere unless there's a really secure area. And of course, it really needs, as by a secure area, I mean about an eight or nine foot fence because they are fantastic jumpers and some of them can jump as high as eight feet. Lottie is a very affectionate dog, 
but it was quite difficult for us all to settle in together because our first dog was a rescue dog, but he was four when he came to us and he'd spent two years at the rescue kennels and was in many ways quite well trained. In fact, in many ways, very well trained. Lottie had only been rescued about two or three months earlier and she was also a very much younger dog, probably only about 18 months old. So she was much more wild and we probably weren't experienced enough dog owners to take on a young dog with quite a few needs and issues. We did call in a dog specialist and they said dog training was the way to go. So we used to take her to dog training classes every Saturday morning for about a year and that certainly helped a lot. Because she's a Saluki and because of her nature, there are certain things we can never expect her to do. Salukis and hunting dogs have very, very poor recall if they're after something. A red mist descends as they head after that rabbit or that squirrel and you'll never get them back. So you, we just have to be really careful about where we exercise her. And there are very, very few places where we can take her off the lead. However, she does love this garden and she's such a loving and affectionate family dog that I think she's happy to have these walks mostly on the lead. Because it's been so wet, I haven't really been able to get out and do very much in the garden. In fact, I can't really point to anything I've done except to get some sacks of organic farmyard manure and scatter them over the beds. The thing with organic is that anyone can call anything organic. It doesn't really mean anything unless the product you're buying is affiliated to an association which ensures it meets certain standards. So you can find quite a lot of organic garden manure, which actually is no such thing, and indeed may have something like amino pyrolids or some other kind of weed killer in it. So when I bought my organic manure, I was very careful to make sure it had a soil association label on it. And if you're in other parts of the world, there will be other organic standards and associations that can help you be sure that what you're buying is actually organic and doesn't have chemicals in it. The reason for worrying about organic manure, because I'm not a wholly organic gardener, I do use chemicals. However, some manures have been contaminated with something called amino pyrolids, and those don't really break down very easily in manure. They're used as weed killers on pasture land, and the cows and horses eat it. It passes through them without harming them, but it doesn't really deteriorate in the manure until it's been laid on the ground for several months. So if you open a packet of manure which has got amino pyrolids in its contamination, you may find that things like your beans absolutely just shrivel and die. I'd suggest going to Charles Dowding's YouTube channel for a very good explanation on this if you're more interested and I will put that link in the description below. If you found this interesting please do hit like because then I'll know you'd like to see more garden tours. I've put the garden tours playlist on at the end of this video so do check it out if you're interested in how the garden changes season by season. And if you would like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your middle-sized garden, then do subscribe to the Middle-Sized Garden YouTube channel and thank you for watching. Goodbye.